This legislature is uh, back from recess. Uh, when we left off, ladies and gentlemen, last night, we were on Bill 245-33 CORs introduced by Speaker Wampat and Munya Barnes. Um, we, I do know that there was discussion by Senator Frank Bloss, and Senator Frank Bloss, I think you had an inquiry to the Speaker. Have you decided on what we want to work with this morning? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, actually, I'm going to yield my time back to the Speaker. No, me. Back to me. Oh. Neither did I. <laughs> you recognize Madam Speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, at the time when, uh, yesterday when we were having this, this discussion, I thank uh, Senator Bloss for, uh, then, uh, for his questions and Senator uh, Tom Adda as well. We had some uh, other discussions uh, at the end of, of the day yesterday. And so to address all of the concerns is that then I would like to just make uh, a motion here to to delete then subsection A, which is on page one, uh, in its entirety. That's the very first thing, and if, may, if I may do that, of course, and then everything else would mean renumbering of the subsections. On the um, uh, proposed amendment to strike subsection A, any objection? Any anybody wish to be heard on it? Anybody wish to be heard on it? And no objection. And, okay, thank you very much. So what it would mean then you go to B, and B then will be uh, renumbered to, to A, and then that would then now actually looking at the authorization now to allow for the solicitation and contract for uh, the lease, uh, for lease and uh, operation, or to operate, lease and operate. That was uh, some discussion that we had with our members. So to add the word and operate uh, the uh, internet cafe. So, so for, on, for the lease. On last line six, lease and operate. Yeah, the internet, internet cafe. Any objection to that amendment? Uh, on line seven <coughs> is then for the operation off, uh, it's going to be a, uh, of a cafe and food establishment. Any objection? And food, and then to continue to add the word cafe and then to keep, leave the food establishment. So it's and, cafe and food establishment. Senator Bloss. <clears throat> I, I just guess uh, if the author can yield to question basically what do we anticipate to be the dif difference, the definition between the two. Um, I, I'm just concerned. We say food establishment, we're going to go a full blown uh, cafeteria no, we, here. Oh. Uh, well, actually, what it would, would still be uh, the same because it's a food establishment to provide drink and food services or. Well, maybe, and originally I know that with, in section A that we took out the selling of coffee and other drinks and snacks, I mean, that was, I know we were supposed to put that language in that uh, originally had amended and that I was going to go to that where it says to drink and food services to change to make it uh, a food establishment to provide uh, coffee, drinks, and other snacks. As opposed where to would you put that in line what? To, where it's in line seven where it says to provide coffee, drinks, and snacks. And that was in, in, in the original A. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I bring this up because as opposed to a cafe, 
then what would be the definition? No, so that's what the cafe is, would be then coffee, drinks, and snacks. It's not a full-blown uh, restaurant, but there's going to be, you know, the snacks, that type of, okay, fine. I, and, unless you're thinking food establishment is like, what you're thinking of, like a, so for the operation of a cafe to provide coffee, drinks, or snacks. Is that what you're thinking of? By the, by the confused gesture and your look and, and your face, can we just have a little bit of a time out here so that we can cut, tighten up that language? Oh, okay. Uh, can you can can I ask if the senator then can look at that language and just let me do the other minor, uh, if just one, sure. two more minor amendments and we can go back. Okay. Thank you. All right. So if we can just hold line seven then. And on line 11 is to delete then for the lease of uh, the frontage property and so that will be for the lease of the internet cafe. Any objection? Uh, deleting on line 11 frontage of frontage property and. And. Oh, and I forgot. <coughs> and on line 8, uh, after the word general public, put a comma, as deemed, so then these are for patrons and public, uh, general public, comma, as deemed appropriate by the library board. No? Okay, so, no? <laughs> Line eight. <laughs> I'm fine with that. <laughs> okay, so, there's an objection, so, delete. Okay, no, no problem. Yeah. Okay. Uh, already She's by, withdrawing it. Yeah, I'm withdrawing it. You're right. So no problem. So, so the only one now is, uh, I guess, if, if we may, Senator, did you have now uh, where it says Line Seven Agatnya for the operation of uh, a cafe? And just put to, cafe to provide food and drink. To provide food and drinks, but then no snacks. Oh, food. Okay, so you're saying to, to provide food? Drink and food services for library patrons and the general public. I'm sorry, can you say that again? What, what you have there exactly, just take out food establishment, okay, so cafe, to, to provide drink and food services for library provide, patrons. To provide drink and food services. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's the... The entire amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Oh, On, and the, go ahead. And so, so the last thing then is that, yes, I have Senator Munoz Barnes as my uh, second co-sponsor. I'd like to add Senator Frank Blas and Senator Tom Ada as well. Thank you very much. On the Senator Blas. Um, yesterday I had brought up the concern with regards to the um, policy and procedures. Are we still putting is there has there been an amendment made to basically say um, interim that will go ahead and permit the interim policy? On page three. Can you go ahead and make it? So, uh, yes, the discussion also focused, and I, I apologize, on page 3, line 4, where the library board then shall then establish interim policy and procedures, you know, uh, for the administration of this section until, you know, the, uh, the AAA uh, process, you know, has been completed. Any objection? The co-sponsorship, any objection? Okay. Who's co-sponsor? Uh, yourself you, and Senator Tina and, and Tom Adda. I thought there was another motion that was going to be made just to make sure. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. On the main motion. On the, oh wait. Senator Espaldon. <clears throat> uh, if I could just uh, ask a question of the author. There's a question being posed. 
Uh, the, Authors? The question is that we're allowing for, and before I ask you to yield, uh, the question is, is if we're going down this road of allowing for an internet cafe, is this cafe going to have the privilege of using the internet hookup of the library that is being paid for by the library, uh, or are they going to have to hook up their own services? Madam Speaker, there, there's questions being posed. The internet service uh, is basically, I mean, it's an internet cafe. The question is, if the library has its own internet uh, costs, will this cafe be utilizing the library's internet, or are they going to have to provide their own? And I would imagine that the answer would be that they would use the internet's. So is there going to be any consideration that should be put in here that uh, perhaps uh, should reflect that they're going to be able to compete with a, uh, I mean, that they shouldn't be allowed to compete against other cafes in the area at government cost? My, my understanding is that, uh, first of all, the library will have the internet. The library also will have uh, laptops that will be made available to be used by the patrons even in the cafe. And what they wanted to do was then to, that the monies that they're going to collect would be that uh, to pay for their needs, uh, at, which is on page two, uh, which will be for f improvement, supplies, programs, maintenance, but that they would also, in their RFP, they're going to make sure that they are also going to be responsible for uh, maintaining the, uh, the computers because apparently they, they have them already and they will be available and they will be using them. But the upkeep and maintenance of it that the, the individuals who, are, who have the, uh, the bid to run the cafe will be responsible for all those. That's what, because we had asked. I guess in essence, they'll be using the library's internet. Yes. And uh, to be able to establish. Yes, because already they have the computers there that are available, but they want to make, they want to be able to, I guess, promote the, the cafe at the same time by having those, uh, they have six laptops uh, available already to be used. Okay, thank you, Mr. Speaker. On the main motion, any other questions? Senator Tom Adda. I, I kind of miss the discussion that was had earlier, but it, it appears that we really kind of are making this a little bit more complicated than it is. And, and really, I think what we should be doing is, first of all, just repealing that part of what the original law was, which had intended to lease the yard space, frontage space, or whatever for a, a mobile canteen type, right? Okay, you did that, fine. Now, the second part then is what we really should be authorizing then is to authorize the library to lease, authorizing them to lease that portion of the building that is known as the, in the title it says, to lease that portion of the building referred to as the Internet Cafe for the purpose of operating and managing a high quality and reasonably priced uh, cyber cafe services. Now, all the details of, you know, uh, who's going to pay for the Internet and all that, that really should be part of the request for proposal. But I think for us here, our, our responsibility should be to, do we want to give them that authority to lease out that government space for purposes of operating a cyber cafe services for the library patrons? patrons? And if we do, then really that's the extent of it. I don't think we want to go into the business plan, you know, formulating the business plan for the library and, 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 st and stipulating what is the purpose of the revenues that are to be generated. So we're authorizing them to lease floor space for the purpose of uh, the operation of a cyber cafe and the funds generated shall be used for the maintenance of the facility and other programs, period. I think that's how it ended finally. That's all we have. We've repealed A and 
though the question was raised, there were no amendments to include any of those provisions. On the main motion, on the main motion, do you wish to close, Madam Speaker, or send them when you barns? She, she just must see, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, I do rise in su uh, support uh, of Bill 245-33 COR, and I thank the author for making me her co-sponsor. But just uh, in speaking with the good senator from Santa Rita, uh, there were some commitments on the amendments that we needed to take care of. And on page two, page two. Yeah, a motion for uh, legal counsel that in anywhere in the legislation as it relates to the frontage property to have legal counsel uh, work the... Deleted, okay. Delete, yeah. Any objection to authorizing legal counsel to remove all mention of frontage property? So that's... There being two, none. Yeah, and okay. <clears throat> that's it, right? Thank you. On the main motion, on the motion to send the bill down to the voting file. Bill 149, Senator Tony Ada, you recognize? Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, uh, yesterday we left off on, on, on uh, proffering some amendments, and I do have those amendments uh, ready. Okay. They're, they're really short amendments, and I didn't want to uh, uh, Xerox, uh, didn't want to cut down a tree just for a couple of short amendments here. We're going to uh, page three. And it's down on uh, the second paragraph of A, after $25,000 uh, each toward of the minor, and then in case of said injury to a person, imputed liability shall be further limited to medical, dental, hospital expenses incurred by the injured person. Right after the inju injured person, uh, like the property amendment, an attorney's fees as allowed by Article 6 of Chapter 26 of 7 GCA. everybody following on page three and it's one two three four five six lines from the bottom where it says injured person at the words and attorney fees as allowed by article six of chapter 26 of 7 GCA Everybody following? Any objections? Any discussion? No objections? So ordered. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Senator. Madam Speaker, the second amendment will be on page four on line one. And it's after the word attorney fees will be what will add as allowed by Article 6 of Chapter 26 of 7 GCA. So then yeah, page four in the top of page four after attorney fees at the words as allowed by article six of chapter 26, seven GCA, is that correct? Yes, Madam Speaker. Senators, are you following along? No objections? No questions? No discussions? So ordered. And the third amendment, Madam Speaker, will be on page four on uh, paragraph C. It's just to delete the paragraph, the complete paragraph there. Which is uh, C, subsection C? Yes. So the other amendment then on page four is to delete the two lines of subsection C. Any discussion? I hear see some going on in between, but I'm not sure whether some of you would like to yeah, but how about the rest of us over there? 
Senator, I, yeah, I, that's why I'm saying because I, I know you were, you were kind of asking around for copies to. I just want to make sure the legal counsel as well is really uh, on top of this, that on page three, uh, legal counsel, uh, the seventh line from the bottom is to add the words and attorney fees as allowed by Article 6 of Chapter 26, 7 GCA. And page 4, the same thing as allowed by Article 6 of Chapter 26, 7 GCA. And Senator Torres, is, it, uh, the last one that I haven't yet gaveled in was the deletion of uh, subsection C. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And if we can just have legal counsel renumber the remaining paragraphs. So as we yes. take out C, then so we'll just move up. And Senator Torres, are you, are you, do you have a question or a comment on C? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. So, all right. So then, but the, the last amendment here to, that's, uh, to delete will be the adjustment every two years by the Judicial Council to reflect any increases in the cost of living in Guam. So that's the last amendment. Any objections yeah. to that amendment? No objections? So ordered. Okay, Senator Ada. Uh, and legal counsel, yes, will. Um, oh, and, right. and the, the last amendment then is that legal counsel then to uh, for any technical amendments in the uh, adjustment of the uh, subsections. So ordered. And I'd like to add uh, Senator uh, Tom Adda and Senator Jim Espaldon as co-sponsors, Madam Speaker. Senator Adda and Senator Espaldon, no objections, so ordered. Right, on the main motion now, if anyone would like to speak. I know some of you had some questions yesterday. Um, this is your opportunity, main motion, uh, to be able to speak. But not, I, oh, you did already, so you're done. Senator Torres, I know you had uh, some questions yesterday. Is there anybody else who would like to, to speak on the main motion? There being none, so on the motion to send 149 uh, to the third reading file, no objection, so order it. Bill number 185, Senator Rodriguez. Good morning, Madam Speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Speaker, I believe when we broke, there was um, some efforts to make uh, amendments on Bill 185. Yes, I'm, so I'm, I'm trying to find now my list where I, we left off. Who did we leave off with on 185? I think the la yeah the last person I had on 185 was uh, Senator Espaldon. So Senator Espaldon, I know when yesterday I had asked that uh, because of uh, the concern from, if I can recap and correct me if I'm wrong, is the a message that was sent down from the AG's office. Uh, of several concerns about ser several sections, and I've asked, I'd rather given you an opportunity uh, yesterday before bringing this uh, forward again this morning uh, to proffer some amendments ad addressed by the Attorney General's office. And if anybody else also, I know at, mo at one time Senator St. Nicholas indicated that he was also going to do some amendments, but unfortunately, um, you know, he won't be in uh, this morning due to a medical um, appointment. So I will then turn the floor over to you, Senator Spaldon. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I was uh, doing a few things, multitasking here. The, when you initially just called upon right now a few minutes ago, I, I just was going to ask is, uh, did, did the author of the bill just say that he has a few amendments that he would like to make? Senator, none? Okay, so no, he does not then. Okay, well, if I may, Madam uh, Speaker, 
The, I was informed that the Attorney General may be coming down between 10.30 and 11. And uh, because, of, because of her memo or letter to us, uh, it might behoove us to perhaps wait for her to, to chime in on some of these concerns that she has, whether they're valid in our minds or not, but at least to be able to expound upon them and give us the opportunity to perhaps uh, talk with her. So I'll leave it to your discretion, Madam Speaker, whether to give her a few minutes and allow me to make a call, see if, there, if she is coming down. If not, then we'll proceed. Yeah, because I, I did say that I wouldn't mind, that's why yesterday, to set it aside all that time for the rest of the afternoon. Okay. You know, well, then, to, that, to in that case, Madam Speaker, uh, you know, there are some concerns. There. Yes, so you may continue, Senator. I mean, I'm hoping she'll make it here within five minutes, and it'll be 10.30 by the time. Well, so if you, Senator, I tell you what, if I mean, you can give me one minute, just make a call and see if she'll be here, because if she's not going to be here, then there's no use waiting for her. Okay, so we'll, we'll do that then, just to make a, a phone call. Thank you. Recess.
Senators, um, I understand there are still more amendments uh, being uh, uh, prepared for 149, so I'm going to set it aside and I'll move on. One, I mean, sorry, 185, thank you, Senator. Uh, we had finished one. Uh, that's why you're our secretary. Thank you so very much. So I'm going to go to the next bill, and Senator Torres, you're recognized on 248. Jesus Mossy, Madam Chairman. Madam Chairman, I moved to accept Bill Number 248-33COR as substituted by the Committee on Finance and Taxation, General Government Operations and Youth Development, and further substitute it on the floor. On the motion to, to, to accept, no objection, so ordered. Thank you, Senator. Madam Chair, I also move that we place Bill Number 248-33 on the third reading file, and if I may uh, be given permission to discuss. You may proceed, Senator. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, Bill Number 248-33 is a bill intended to modernize Guam's family leave laws and to find a balance that benefits both families and government employers. I'd like to read from the legislative findings and intent. The legislature in Guahan finds that it is beneficial to local families, the local community, and local workforce to provide a reasonable amount of paid leave to new mothers. Research shows that paid leave contributes not only to the health and welfare of mother and child, but also makes it more likely that women will return to the workforce after giving birth. Likewise, it is essential to the development of creating strong families that we provide all parents, regardless of gender, the time to bond and welcome a new child into their home and family. What inspired me to introduce this bill also is in January 2015, the President of the United States issued a presidential memorandum directing that federal executive agencies increase the amount of paid leave to be used by federal employees and increase it to the equivalent of six weeks in connection with the birth or adoption of a child. In doing so, the President so aptly stated that now, more than ever, our nation's economic success rests on our ability to empower our citizens to choose jobs that best utilize their talents and interests. All employers, including the federal government, should support parents to ensure that they can both contribute fully in the workplace and also meet the needs of their families. The availability of paid maternity leave, for example, has shown to increase the likelihood that mothers return to their jobs following the birth of a child and maternity leave has also shown to improve the health and development outcomes of the infant. In addition, it is critically important for parents and their newborn or newly adopted child to have the opportunity to form strong family attachments and relationships. At present under Guam law, in the event of childbirth or adoption of a child five years or younger, we provide four weeks of so-called maternity leave under Section 4107 of Article 4, Title 4, GCA, and four, works, four weeks of so-called paternity leave under Section 4107.1. Under current law, the eligibility is to a female employee occupying a permanent position, which the statute doesn't clearly define this, and paternity leave is granted to a male employee occupying a permanent position. Our current law also provides for an additional leave of up to six months that may be taken and charged against uh, a combination of leave, six leave or unpaid leave. What my bill does is it actually, if, if you were to look at current law, it's quite ambiguous about how leave is to be taken. And in discussions with the Department of Administration, oftentimes the application of leave in the various agencies is, is applied at the discretion and sometimes the misinterpretation of the law by the HR personnel. What I have done with Bill Number 248 is I've taken into account the needs to provide adequate leave for a mother upon the birth of a child. And my focus primarily in this bill is to ensure that a mother a woman who gives birth to a child is given ample time to recover, to medically recover from the symptoms 
of uh, having given birth. And what my bill does then is it extends for the birth mother her leave, her paid administrative leave from four weeks to six weeks. It gives her an additional two weeks. There were many considerations that, that also had to be taken into account when we were applying leave um, with regard to the EEOC Equal Employment Opportunity Commission concerns. And what we didn't want to do was set a precedent for challenge later on. So what we did, as you understand now, the climate has changed a little bit. Uh, what we once thought as a traditional couple with a family is now different. It is no longer just mother and father. It could be mother, it could be single mother, it could be um, a gay couple, father and father, male and male, or it could be a lesbian couple, female and female. And what we wanted to do with this bill is ensure that there was equality across the board in terms of leave. And so what I did is I fashioned it so that we now have, rather than a distinct maternity and paternity leave, we have one catch-all parental leave category. And this parental leave will apply to everybody, mothers, fathers, adoptive parents, and same-sex couples as, as they may. So we now have, rather than maternity leave, we have a new category under 4107 that is called pregnancy-related medical leave. And under pregnancy-related medical leave, a woman who gives birth to a child will now have two weeks of leave. She's a distinct category, and, uh, and this relates specifically to her. And then with the other, um, other cases, we have parental leave where as is with the law, a mother who gives birth or a father will now, ha or a father who has a child born to him um, or a child adopted into his household will still maintain the four weeks of paid administrative leave. So that has not changed. All that's changed is the birth mother now has an additional two weeks. What my bill does also is it takes care of some of the um, concerns that, that, uh, that were pointed out specifically when we spoke to the Department of Administration, and that was the application of leave. Uh, if people were to take an additional, additional leave, which is a combination of um, sick leave or unpaid leave or annual leave, and what my bill does is it, it very um, succinctly tells you what you may do, and what order of leave must be taken so that it is consistent across the board. But I think it's also important to point out in this bill, under the, the existing law, eligibility was defined as a, um, eligibility was defined as a full, as a, a, a female occupying a permanent position or a male occupying a permanent position. Under present law, that permanent position usually applies only to classified employees. We know that that's not the way it's applied uh, in Gov Guam presently, but the law, the law spells it that way. So what my bill does is it makes it clear that we are now considering eligible female classified employees and female classified employees as well as male classified employees and female classified employees. So it is very clear that by law now, anyone who occupies a full-time position as a classified or unclassified employee in the government will be eligible for, for leave on the occasion of a birth or adoption of a child five years or under. Um, I ask my colleagues to please consider uh, this bill very favorably. What it is is it, it, it not only modernizes and, and makes the, um, the lead practices more clear, more succinct, and more uh, fair, but it is mostly a compassionate bill that takes into account the true physical needs of a mother upon the birth of a child and how we have to, if you were to consider the, the usual postpartum recovery period is six weeks, this brings the, the paid administrative line leave in line with that six-week postpartum period. 
So it really is a compassionate bill, not only to help our employees get back on their feet and recover, but it also helps the employers and the, and the, empl and the employment environment by, by facilitating the recovery of employees so that when they do come back to work um, after the birth of their children, that they are a little more whole than they would be if they didn't have this extended leave. Um, I also want to point out that um, there, is, there is one um, edit that I'm going to make to my bill right now. We just noticed a, a typo as we were going through. And that will be on page 2, line 20. We are, um, we are striking the word or adoption from, the, um, from line 20. Because pregnancy-related medical leave is specific to a category of, of of a um, person who has just birthed a child. On the amendment, to delete the word or adoption. No objection, so ordered. On the... Uh, no, the, um, just to clarify, the bill, as further substituted on the floor, incorporates all... all um, yes, they're all already included. All considerations. So, so this is the final version right. that we are reviewing. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Senator. So, Senator Munya Barnes and then Vice Speaker. Is there, is there as, as further substituted? Yes. Yes. As further substituted on the floor. Yes. So, where's uh, that? so there's three. I, I don't have that. Okay, so can you please make sure all of the members? And further substituted. So, you should have the. Uh, in bold letters and further substitute it on the floor. Please check your desk. I know that they were passed out. Thank you, Senator. Senator Munya Barnes, you recognize? Sizus Masi, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, uh, I truly appreciate um, the author's uh, legislation and, and really um, stand in support of the intent of Bill 248-33. And, and, and literally working with the, um, this paternity, maternity and paternity leave for all, for employees of Gov Guam. I do have a, a concern or maybe an inquiry on section two, if I may. Um, she deletes, she, she deletes um, several portions, uh, uh, I mean several lines of um, for GCA, and one that comes to mind is the um, uh, pregnancy-related medical leave shall consist of paid administrative leave not to um, exceed the 10 work days, but it went from 20, from almost three weeks to just 10 days. And if you count it the weekends, then, but you normally don't count that. So, and then, the authorization for, uh, without approval from the employer uh, of supervisor, uh, employee supervisor uh, of the six months, that was also deleted. And I just wanted to know what the, the differences were based on the edits, because I see that there is um, provisions here for both uh, male and female, but the changing of the, of the days and then also the authorization uh, without the approval of the employee's uh, uh, supervisor. Senator, do you yield if to I the may? questions? I, there are two questions, but yes, we'll do I, one I, at a time. I will yield to both. Okay. Thank you for, for asking that. And, and that's what makes this uh, such a unique type of legislation. Because now what we've done is rather than having two categories of mother and father, right. we now have parental. Parental captures guaranteed four weeks of paid administrative leave to either a, a woman or a man. And it could be the woman who's adopting, it could be the, the lesbian woman yeah. so, Senator, um, please spouse. Address the or, chair, please. Or address. Please address the chair. Thank yes, you. Thank you. So parental leave is the catch-all for all parents, regardless of your gender or regardless of your marital status. That is where parental leave gives you the four weeks of paid administrative leave. 
the, the pregnancy-related medical leave is a two-week paid administrative leave just for the birth mother. So the way the bill is written, the birth mother has the benefit of both. She has the benefit of pregnancy-related medical leave, and she has the benefit of parental leave. So her total paid administrative leave will be six, le six weeks. So we, we struck it this way because now we're not having a distinct class, Madam Chair, of maternity and paternity. We're having parental. You are a parent. But if you are also a birth parent, the birth mother, we will give you two more weeks to recover medically. So that's, that's why it was struck this way, but it is also, uh, Madam Chair, brought up and accounted for in the parental leave section under 4107.1. Uh, yeah, ma ma Madam Speaker, if I may, I just want to confirm with legal counsel to uh, work with the numbers here because I want to make sure that based on her answer and opening up the opportunity to both um, male and female, that, the, that what was, that's existing today is not taken away uh, from, from the pregnant mother. So, I can just confer with legal I'm going, counsel. I'm going to and go you can to come the back. next. Yes, I'm going to Please. go to the next speaker, Thank you. Mr. Vice Speaker, and I will give you an opportunity to come back. Mr. Vice Speaker, and then Senator Tom Adam. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, uh, though I'm probably the only person in here that. Yes, we know. Doesn't have any. Um, I rise in full support of this piece of legislation. Um, most recently, I. Uh, I've had the great honor of being christened Tata. Um, and I had spoken to the author about, of this bill about the fact that uh, I've noticed, at least in, in, in the case of my nephew the, the, and her, and her son-in-law, what great assistance real engaged fathers who deserve the title father, um, provide in assisting. And how I initially chided her about the fact that the additional time should also be given to the male to assist the, uh, the mother during that very difficult period. I, I didn't realize how difficult it was watching um, the, the, the care of a newborn child and um, how a real engaged father um, can provide uh, invaluable assistance and support to the the mother of the of the child. And so, but I think this is excellent legislation. To at least, if there's been any complications, that she has additional 10, 10 days. And I know the question that was being asked <clears throat> was whether or not the the time difference has been reduced. And my under understanding is that it's not. The parental leave makes sure that both, both parents have 20 days, but the, but the woman who suffered through, the, through the, um, either the natural childbirth or the cesarean section has an additional 10 days. So I, I think it's excellent legislation. I, and I commend the, uh, the sponsor for, for this piece of legislation because I really do think that it's imperative uh, that people who assume responsibility of a, of, of a child coming into this world, whether through natural birth to themselves or by adoption, have the, the, the 20 days to bond with the child and the importance of having that bonding, that bonding period uh, for both male and female and for the bonding period for even the adoptive parents to welcome a child. I mean, we had foster parents here the other day for one of my hearings, and um, to, to have a child come into the house that was adopted, to have that child feel welcome in that house, to have both parents there uh, is, is, is imperative, to, to, to make that child feel that this new place that they're at is their home. And I'm very happy that it has up to the age of five to try to make sure that, um, um, that, the, that the, both parents, I mean, I know members of our, our legislature who 
are probably should be named model father or model parent because of the love that they have for the children that they've taken into their home and you know you don't need to use them stepdad or my adopted dad or whatever they are the father and they give they give credence to that name father and I really really appreciate the fact that we're trying to assist in that bonding period by giving them the 20 days and then for the ones that had to go through the the actual um, delivery or uh, of the child that they get an additional 10 days in the event that they need that for for their recovery so I rise in full support of this legislation and commend the author welcome mr. vice speaker on the motion senator Tom Adam you recognize uh, thank you madam speaker I certainly rise in support of um, the um, concept of the bill um, However, I, I do have a question about the eligibility, uh, the eligibility of employees. So in page two, um, starting there at line 25 uh, or line 26, it talks about a, a eligible female employee is defined as a full-time classified or full-time unclassified employee. Okay, I'm fine with that. but. Should, should the employee be eligible for this leave benefit um, only if pregnancy occurs after they have become an employee? So in other words, uh, an employee is picked up today, next month she becomes pregnant, and then, you know, so then nine months later they're, they're going to be wanting this leave. Would, would also the the individual who, let's say, is now seven months pregnant, applies for a job, gets hired, and um, two months onto the job, she, uh, is the benefits going to be provided to that individual? Or should it only be made applicable to pregnancy that occurs after employment after that, that has you know occurred after the employment has become effective. Senator, do you yield to the question? I'd like to thank my colleague for bringing that up. That was one of the considerations that we bantered with, um, even when we were discussing the the issue with employers and with Department of Administration. I think what we have to be mindful about when we when we start talking about about pregnancy is that. We, we cannot put ourselves in a situation where we're discriminatory. And I know that there are, there are certain um, considerations when you hire people. You cannot discriminate against a, a person who could potentially have a child or who is, you know, uh, with child at the time of hire. And I, I, what this speaks to is the heart of this bill is to make sure that when you've got people who want to make a choice between being gainfully employed and, and contributing to a, an organization um, and being a parent, having a family, that, that you give them the full opportunity to, to have both and not have to sacrifice one for the other. And one of the, the, you know, one of the most heartwarming um, testimonies came from such a person, um, one in the form of, of um, actually, who, who appeared, uh, who happened to be my, my daughter. And in her, in her words, one of the things she said is, you know, do not punish us for choosing us, for having us choose to have children. And I think that, that what, what I tried to do in this is, is to be very fair and to ensure that we didn't have any semblance of discrimination whatsoever. So the way that I fashioned this bill is we do give, it would provide for administrative leave regardless of the situation of the, the woman at the time she was hired, whether she was six months pregnant at the time she was hired, or whether she became pregnant, you know, during her probationary period, this bill even provides for that. Uh, what to do in, in cases where they're probationary employees still. I think that that it, it the spirit of the the um, the spirit of the presidential memorandum, the spirit of the testimony, and just the nature of, of wanting to ensure that we 
give our, our mothers the ability to be contributing members of an organization and to also be effective and healthy parents um, would suggest to me that, that we consider that this type of administrative leave is afforded to them and that we don't have any semblance of discrimination against a woman who is with child. Senator Anna, was you able to respond to your questions? And you still have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and, and quite frankly, that causes me concern because then now it becomes an open-ended thing. I mean, can you imagine? I've got a lot of constituents out there. Um, you know, I, I, could, I, could, I could return political favors to them and pick up uh, several women who are seven months pregnant, eight months pregnant uh, on my payroll and they become eligible. So, so I'm just very concerned that, you know, this, this opens a different door now uh, that, that is kind of, quite frankly, kind of scary uh, from a financial standpoint. And so I would like to, um, I would like to make an amendment uh, to add at the end of line 27 on page two, the, the, the verbiage um, in, the, in defining an eligible female employee is that an, an eligible female employee is defined as a full-time classified or full-time unclassified female employee and whose pregnancy is determined to have occurred subsequent to employment. I mean, it's the same thing where uh, I, I don't know how it works for health insurance. Uh, m maybe we've taken care of that where you know, I can't sign up for an insurance policy today, and usually they don't cover pre prior existing conditions. So that, Madam Speaker, is, is the amendment that I would like to make. Uh, and and I, I certainly fully support the idea about, you know, encouraging, uh, you know, encouraging these women or, or not having to put them in a position where they have to make a choice between should I work or should I, uh, you know, raise a family or what. But I, I think we got to define those parameters a little bit better. And, and so the amendment uh, that I'm making uh, basically says that um, you're eligible if your pregnancy is determined to have occurred subsequent to employment. Thank you. On the amendment, I have a, well, we'll give the author first, then Senator Underwood. Senator Torres. Madam Speaker, may I please request that legal opinion, uh, legal counsel opine on that amendment before we proceed with the vote on it? Okay, we're gonna take a brief recess.
the legislature is back in session. Uh, prior to the recess, um, we were on Senator Ada's amendment, and Senator Ada, you're recognized. Gentlemen, we're back on. Senators, please, we're back in session. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Madam Speaker, I've given it a lot of thought, and I think the best way to put it is that in the interest of preserving the well-being of the male species, <laughs> I will withdraw my amendment. Thank you. You're very welcome on that withdrawal. No objection, so ordered. Thank you, Senator. So that, I'm sorry, uh, Senator Underwood, you can't speak on that amendment then, so. Uh, I have Senator Bloss on the list uh, to speak. Uh, is he here? Uh, he's not here. Uh, is there anybody else who would like to speak? To want to be recognized and given an opportunity to speak? No, on the main motion now. The amendment has been withdrawn. Senator Underwood. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I too rise in support of this very important bill, uh, not only as a mother and also as a grandparent, grandmother. But you know, Madam Speaker, I, I really do commend the, the author for, for um, uh, presenting this, this bill. I do know that from personal experience in another country, Canada, Victoria, Canada, I believe they do give the mother and the mother at least a year with the baby. And you know, I hope that we would get to that point when we recognize how important it is for us to invest in developing relationships within our family, in strengthening our family. I do know that there will be a tendency for those who would say, what is the fiscal impact? Because in the Department of Education, for example, you would have, uh, we have a large number of teachers uh, we have, and perhaps the majority of the teachers are, are mothers or are female, but we, you know, when they're not in the classroom, they would certainly need a substitute. But at this point, this is where we as a community should, should rise up and not count our pennies regarding the the positive impact that we will have in the development of our, in the nurturing of our families, but that we would, in fact, start putting our families first, put our children first, and, and just as a whole, just really being more sensitive to what mothers go through when they give birth. So again, I, uh, I commend um, the good center from Santa Rita, and I stand in full support of this bill. I'm looking forward to that day when we can amend it to extend the time to even perhaps three months or six months. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You're welcome, Senator. On the main motion, Senator Bloss, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Madam Speaker, I applaud the, uh, the author for the, uh, the idea and the intent of the, of the legislation. Um, I do have a couple of concerns with, uh, with some of the language. First off, on page two, and um, basically line 16, Oh, sorry, from line 14, pregnancy-related medical leave shall be granted to an eligible female employee as a result of pregnancy, child, childbirth, or medically-related conditions to pregnancy or childbirth. Then it goes on to say that pregnancy-related medical leave shall consist of paid administrative leave not to exceed 10 work days, encompassing the date of the childbirth. My concern here is that recognizing that as a result of the pregnancy, there may be pregnancy-related conditions that need to be tended to prior to the childbirth. Now, if the female, if the, the, the 
the lady is, um, needs to get that medical attention, while it falls under this category that she can use leave under, under pregnancy related medical leave, what so happens is as if the amount of leave necessary to tend to that, um, I guess that issue, the pregnancy issue, exceeds the amount of leave um, afforded here, but then is outside the realm of the date of childbirth. She may have, in the case, because of, the, of, of a condition, medical condition, theoretic, she, could, she could exhaust all of that leave as a result of that pregnancy-related medical condition. Then what leave does she have afterwards? Or will that become an issue? So I guess that, that, that's a, first off, that's the first concern I pose to the author, um, and if the author can yield to that question, or is there a necessity to be able to, to separate that out? I, I applaud that, and, and you know, I see the need, and I know that there are some ladies that, you know, when they're pregnant, they have con, you know, medical conditions as was, you know, because of the pregnancy. And I'm just concerned that using this is going to expend all of that leave prior to the childbirth. Senator, do you yield to the question? Thank you for the question. I think what we have to also take into consideration is that the appointing authority and the employer supervisor also have the latitude to accommodate situations as they present themselves. I think that what this does is it takes care of a typical type of situation. Now, um, there are, within the same body, we had other provisions for the type of, of leave sharing and catastrophic situations and whatnot. And I think that, um, I think that those sorts of, of of accommodations do happen. I don't believe that, that, that keeping it within this harms it. I think what it does is it makes sure that the leave is applied properly for the situation. But should situations, extenuating situations, warrant added leave, we do have within the parental leave um, the authority of the, of the um, agencies to grant up to 130 work days, which is six months. Now, anything beyond that is also at the discretion of the employee to um, either grant leave on an unpaid basis or, a, you know, using a catastrophic pool or shared leave basis. But in terms of, of pregnancy-related medical leave, um, it is my opinion after thoughtful consideration that, that perhaps it's best left this way so that it, it, it is a typical, very easy to apply leave. And anything beyond what is not typical or ordinary can be addressed with a combination of other options provided by law. Thank you. Senator, were you able, were I able appreciate, to respond? I appreciate it, Madam Speaker, but you know, I, I, mean, I don't think any of us have a crystal ball. Um, you know, in that we don't know, and we want the best environment for the, and I, you know, I, I, I want to make this better. I want to make it so that she doesn't, she's not have to, she doesn't have to worry about this. And, you know, you, you, she may end, go, go, go to the, doctors because she's just feeling a little discomfort and was a little concerned take leave to be able to take have that doctor's visit but as a result of that doctor's visit it's something more complex so we can't anticipate that and while I appreciate that you know we have that section C in page three, it's going to be very hard, difficult to ascertain and, and, and to determine when you can use that portion or when you have to stay to this portion. And I don't just don't want that to be a doubt in anybody's mind with that. Again, I like the idea. It's just that if we're going to do that and we're going to make sure, I, I just want to make sure that it, when she gives birth, she has that time. I don't want that time to be utilized or to be spent 
you know, on the pregnancy-related condition that existed prior to the childbirth. And then give the authority to, you know, the appointing authority say, well, you used it then this much, you can only use this much here. I think it's going to be counterproductive. So, you know, for, for, for discussion purposes, uh, would it be then because there is that protections provided in Section C, um, would that then be prudent then to, pre to pre preserve that amount of time that should be available, that should be used for, after the childbirth to protect that just for the childbirth and strike the words pregnancy in section A. Because I can see where you know, we want to make sure that there's that time, that additional time after the childbirth. I want to protect that. And it looks like we have the ability to be able to, to address the pregnancy-related issues in Section C. So I guess that's, that's my what are you suggesting to delete? Delete pregnancies. Uh, no, yeah, I, we're going to have to take a recess because... Okay.
legislature is back from recess. We're going to, <laughs> from recess to another recess until two o'clock this afternoon, because I understand that the, the legal counsel is working with us, the, the proffer of, the, the author of uh, an amendment. So until two o'clock this afternoon, we will continue where we've left off. Okay, recess. <laughs>